Our next presenter is a veteran of the U.S. Navy. He holds a bachelor's degree of science from Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University. He is a commercial pilot as well as an A&P. He uh, is an aircraft safety investigator and currently teaches in the NTSB Academy and the Transportation Safety Institute and also numerous fire departments. He's currently building an F-1 rocket. His topic today is accident investigation for technically advanced aircraft. Let's welcome Mr. Mike Bush. Thank you, Walt. Good morning. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, we want to talk a little bit about uh, technically advanced aircraft and the accident investigations that we do around them. And uh, before we go much further, I have to remind you that if you're involved with any aircraft accident inve investigation, that it's a federal jurisdiction under the NTSB. We have a lot of uh, good folks out there who do rescues and first response and so forth, and uh, they don't always know some of the rules. And they don't realize that this is a federal jurisdiction and uh, that the wreckage should not be removed or moved uh, because it is federal evidence without permission from the NTSB. So that's something I wanted to pass along right up front. So what's a technically advanced aircraft? Well, a technically advanced aircraft looks pretty complex when you first look in the cockpit, but basically it's one which would contain a GPS navigator with a moving map plus any additional systems such as advanced uh, engine management uh, systems such as uh, FADEC and so forth, uh, glass avionics, multifunction displays and so forth. It looks pretty complicated and can be fairly intimidating, but I will say that uh, these aircraft are enabling fairly inexperienced pilots to fly very complex missions today. And in our own customer base, we're finding that they fly these aircraft a lot. So they're getting utility from these aircraft. We're flying two and three hours a day per aircraft. Cirrus has now uh, passed the million mile, or excuse me, the million hour flight mark of our fleet. And we only have 3,700 airplanes out there. But uh, the technically advanced aircraft can't keep us from some of the basic accidents. Uh, we're still running out of gas. We're, we're still bumping into things and we're still flying VFR into IMC. So those are things that uh, these new avionics and so forth can't help us. We are learning that although the accident rate seems to be fairly consistent, flat, hasn't decreased much, we are seeing fewer fatal accidents, which is, which is always good. Now, some of this technology isn't exactly uh, uh, helpful. Uh, for example, you can go out and buy a pilot handheld GPS unit, fly around with it and so forth, and um, fairly inexpensively, I might add, and uh, you'll find that uh, it will provide what we call a breadcrumb trail, or in other words, uh, a path that the aircraft had followed in flight. And that can be very useful to accident investigators. We want to know uh, what circumstances the pilot was in uh, before the accident. And, um, you know, these are fairly inexpensive things. I think the same features are in involved on some of these very inexpensive uh, GPS that hikers use and, and boaters can use. Um, but, you know, these very expensive uh, panel mount GPS units don't have that feature. Even though the technology is there and some of the same manufacturers make these various units, we don't have breadcrumb trails on the uh, panel mount GPSs, which can be kind of frustrating for us when we're trying to figure out what happened at the site. So um, we have to do it other ways. Now you'll find that accident investigators, I don't want to use the word sneaky, but we do have to get innovative and, and uh, think about how we're going to go about solving this mystery. And there are a lot of mysteries to solve. And, uh, that's why we call it probable cause, because sometimes we just don't get all the information that we need. But the TAAs have helped us a lot. And it goes without saying, uh, gee, you know, if you're looking at all this stuff on the screen in the aircraft, it would make sense that at some point uh, all these sensors picked this stuff up. It had to be processed somehow electronically and made into some sort of digital format so that we could put it on a screen for the pilot to view. How do we capture that stuff? And, you know, uh, we learned quite by accident that um, uh, some of these new screens were not really designed for accident investigation purposes, obviously, but the data is there. I mean, there's immense amount of data on, the, on these new uh, glass panels. And so uh, we learned, quite by accident, that the uh, people who designed these things had put in a little uh, a card, an a electronic a circuit board in the back for troubleshooting purposes. When the thing came back to the shop, they could use this little card for helping them figure out why the box wasn't working right. And we learned that it had a bit of a memory to it. And the first thing we figured out was that, say, you know, there's engine parameters on this. Maybe we can figure out what the RPM was or the temperatures was from this troubleshooting device. It was not designed to hold a lot of memory, somewhat like the uh, flight data recorders have on, on the airliners with, you know, a thousand channels of information. Now, GA airplanes 
simply don't have black boxes or even orange ones for that matter. And so we have to go out and solve accidents the old fashioned way. We look at the angles with the tree branches that are broken and, and have to actually do a lot of sleuthing uh, without electronics. So the fact that we can sort of tap into some of these things that are being displayed to the pilot is really good news for us and, it, and it's very exciting. So um, like I say, uh, we've now got access to a lot of things that were simply not available to accident investigators previously. So things like engine run data. Now if you're flying uh, one of these new airplanes with a FADEX system, uh, you can actually get 2,000 hours worth of data from this thing. You can see what the temperatures were on a given time and date and the RPMs and so forth. This is very helpful. And also we have primary flight data that we can get and also some pilot inputs. That's really key. When you can see what switches the pilot selected and when, when he turned them on and off, which ones they were, this is really helpful in accident investigation. Um, mind you, this is sort of experimental, if you will, and, and we kind of happened upon this quite by chance. And so it's been taking a lot of innovation, a lot of hard work to try to glean some of the knowledge from, from this vast amount of, you know, of, of uh, electronic stuff. You have to really do some sorting. It's not to the state of the art where we can just take a chip out of the airplane and plug it in and see a video of what the airplane was doing prior to the accident. We're not there by a long shot. We have made some strides in it though. So the process of recovering this information and then analyzing it is fairly extensive and it's, and it's a lot of hard work, long hours to do it, so it's not easy. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, that and I'm going to show you actually some of the uh, data that we can get and how it can help us in accidents. Uh, I'll, show, I'll review actually three accidents here in just a minute. Um, but I keep hearing the phrase throughout the industry that there are no new accidents. I've heard agencies and, and representatives from, from all corners of the globe talk about the fact that there are no new accidents. We know all about human factors. We know about weather. We know about icing. We know what causes these things. There aren't very many mechanical things that can go wrong and so forth. And uh, I, I just don't think that's quite true anymore. And in fact, with the uh, electronic data that we're we're starting to get from GA accidents now, uh, we're finding out that there might be some new twists on some old things. To the point where in the old days, we used to go to uh, what was euphemistically called a smoking hole accident where, gee, there was just this big wreck and nothing was left. And we didn't know anything about anything. We, we couldn't find any parts to analyze because it all burned up or whatever. Um, you know, you had to make some assumptions and those assumptions probably weren't always correct. And unfortunately, a lot of times the pilot was blamed for this, this unhappy occurrence. I think we've come across the, to the point now where, where uh, we've get, we're getting enough information where we can actually tell what maybe was going on, what sort of led the pilot to certain decisions, or what was going on in the aircraft just prior to the accident. And um, we may even want to think about some of those old smoking hole accidents and say, you know, did we really understand everything that happened that day? And the answer, of course, is no, we did not. So today we have a much better idea of what's going on out there. A couple things that are interesting today, at least on the Cirrus and, and many other aircraft out there, these aircraft are uh, equipped with ballistic parachute systems. What a boon. We, we can, you know, get into trouble out there. The pilot can activate the system. And now we've got a live pilot to talk to. And we've got a whole airplane to look at. No smoke and hole. Gee, that's pretty cool. And, um, you know, we can also now verify some of these things with the electronic data that we can get. Witness statements sometimes are confusing. Sometimes the pilot statements are a little confusing. And so we can now back, us, back this up and compare it to other electronic data directly from the airplane. So some of the new accidents that we've discovered is that something like an autopilot stall was something that I think we speculated about, but nobody really knew, and I don't think we could prove. But we're pretty sure now that you know the, the autopilots are wonderful today. They're, they're marvelous machines. You can put them in, you can program them for the rate of climb that you want and, and the altitude you want to achieve and so forth. Very reliable, very good instruments. And in fact, the autopilot people will tell you that uh, they have never caused an accident, been the cause to one. Um, the fact is, though, it is a machine. And the pilot has to manage that machine just like everything else in the airplane. And if you set it to do something that the airplane can't do, then you know things could go uh, unraveled on you very quickly. Um, so we have this new data, again, not easy to get to, but we can certainly use it very, uh, very positively in what we're doing here. The other new thing I want to talk about, it's not really new, you're going to say, well, d gee, distractions have been around forever. And that's true. Um, you've probably experienced some of these yourself. 
And we've talked uh, in safety uh, circles for a long time about keeping a sterile environment in the cockpit during critical phases of flight, such as takeoff and, and approach and so forth. We want to uh, keep the pilot focused on what he's doing and not be distracted by things that are going on in the cabin or, or the kids getting nervous or whatever. And so the avionics people have provided a little button on the audio panel that allows the pilot to be isolated from that distraction so he can work directly with ATC without being interrupted. So distractions are certainly always uh, an accident factor. And uh, you've seen some of these new ones today yourself, probably even on the way in this morning. There was probably somebody in front of you talking on a cell phone. And I can tell you that that is absolutely a new cause for accidents. We've uh, in recently, uh, in, in, our own, uh, in our own fleet this year, we know for a fact that the pilot was in a very uh, busy environment. He was uh, uh, multitasking as pilots do. And he was actually talking on the cell phone during that time and was distracted by it to the point where he did lose control of the airplane and was not able to regain it. Now, we, we know this because, number one, we recovered the cell phone. And number two, we talked to the uh, person who was on the other end of that conversation. <laughs> And so we know that people are out there talking on their cell phones in airplanes as well as in their cars. And it can certainly be a distraction. I think we take the safety of aircraft for granted. And uh, we feel like we're maybe bored and have to you know, call somebody and talk about the whole thing. That's not necessarily a good thing to do. But it's happening out there. And so it's something we have to uh, really uh, watch these days. So a couple of the accidents we're going to talk about. Uh, we've talked about these uh, GPS units that you can buy that that uh, leave a breadcrumb trail but do not in the airplane. And we can glean some of this data now from, from the glass panels, which can show us all this, all this information, which is really good. Um, I hope in the future that we will be able to extract it much more easily. And from this, we've actually uh, started uh, doing some research on very simple data loggers. And Cirrus is in the middle of this as well. A data logger is simply a, a hardened chip that's placed someplace strategically in the aircraft, for example, in the tail where it won't get damaged, and it plugs directly into this data bus and will record vast amounts of information so we don't have to go through all these stepping stones I'm going to show you about. And again, it's really important to see what the pilot did and when he did it. So we've talked about no new accidents, and I'm going to give you some uh, uh, thoughts here. The second uh, distraction that has been around for a long time, but we haven't really considered it much, are cameras. New digital cameras are really great. They can do a lot of good things. And People have taken a new interest in photography, and we find a lot of people out flying around trying to take pictures of their house and stuff, and we find that they're getting distracted by the mission rather than paying attention to what they're doing. And uh, this has been a, a situation that we had, for example, down in Bull Bay, Jamaica in September of last year. This is an accident of the, one of the three I'm going to talk to you about. You can see from this data that um, here we have the uh, runway and the sort of breadcrumb trail, if you will that we were able to extract. You can see that the aircraft climbs and eventually descends rather rapidly uh, from this picture. And uh, the next one will show you that uh, uh, this aircraft flew across the bay and then, and then actually accident, had an accident. Let me tell you what happened real briefly. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read some of this so I can get it right. But uh, we had four occupants in an SR-22. And we all know that just because you have four seats in an airplane doesn't necessarily mean you can fill them all up especially if you have full fuel, which we did on this particular day. Um, down in Jamaica, the temperature is always about 90 degrees, give or take two or three degrees year round. So these people certainly were used to flying in these conditions, but it was still hot. And uh, the pilot had programmed the autopilot on this particular day to climb at 1,000 feet a minute. Now, the Cirrus will certainly climb at 1,000 feet a minute, but if it's all loaded up, it may not perform at 1,000 feet a minute to the intended climbed altitude, which he had set at... Uh, 9,500 feet. Okay, so he takes off and uh, they climb to 4,300 feet over a two and a half minute uh, period of time. And basically, from the data that we re recovered later, we could see that the airspeed was declining during the whole time he was climbing. Mind you, a steady rate of climb, but the airspeed was just coming down. Got all the way down to 72 knots at 4,300 feet. The aircraft pitch attitude, we could, we could read, went from 20 degrees nose up to 78 degrees nose down rather suddenly, and uh, followed by, as you might imagine, a rapid descent. The, um, there were large variations in uh, pitch and roll during that period of time, and uh, for the next 15 to 20 seconds, the pilot's uh, altitude decayed by 2,000 feet, which is a significant drop in altitude. The pilot realized that he was over his head. He reached over and pulled the handle for the caps, the Cirrus airframe parachute system, and all four people came down safely. 
And you can see in this uh, data here uh, that we did just that. It came down straight down <laughs> under parachute, which was really great. Now it turns out, after we uh, talked to the pilot, who was still pretty shaken up by this, that we could clearly see that the people were on a photo mission. These are the pictures that we retrieved from their cameras. Now that's not exactly TAA stuff, but we could see that, uh, yep, they were up there taking pictures and they were not paying attention to what they were doing. They mismanaged the autopilot. Had he set it for 500 feet a minute on this particular day, probably would have worked out all right. But these are the pictures we got from this particular one. So not paying attention to managing your systems and the autopilot can be a problem. And we can read this data now, which is pretty good. So this might have been uh, an accident that would have been ruled loss of mechanic, loss of control, excuse me, for mechanical reasons, because all we would have had, again, is a smoking hole. Nope, this time we had a parachute available, and uh, we saved four people, and we were able to talk to them, and we were also able to look at the airplane. So that was really good. This, uh, this is up in Massachusetts in August of, uh, this, uh, of last year, uh, up 2007. Now, I, I don't expect you to be able to see this or uh, read it exactly, but we get pages and pages and pages of stuff that looks just like this. It's hardly easy to read, and you have to just pour through this. It's kind of like reading a dictionary. It doesn't make sense until you start comparing and analyzing. So this data, while it is available, isn't necessarily in a user-friendly form. And um, what we can do, is, uh, on this particular case, we have a VFR pilot flying into an IMC condition. And what we can do here in the white letters on this uh, particular slide, you can see that these are the transcripts that we got from ATC. The red letters are the pilot's replies to ATC. Uh, along this pink uh, breadcrumb trail, which we extracted from the aircraft, are uh, times and places of when he was actually communicating uh, with ATC. And we could also now kind of overlay this with radar data. Radar data is really good if you can get it. Sometimes you can't. And sometimes radar data uh, can be fairly inaccurate in, in that some of these radars turn at different speeds. And so you get a hit every four seconds or every seven or 11 seconds or something. So you get this sort of dotted line, but you don't necessarily get the whole picture of, of where the airplane was because at cruise speed, certainly in a Cirrus, you can cover a lot of real estate. With this kind of information, we can now see a complete picture with no holes in it and know exactly what was being communicated, where it was being communicated, and so forth. Uh, this particular occasion, the pilot uh, was uh, flying into the instrument conditions. Uh, he asked to shoot an instrument approach. The uh, tower asked if he was instrument qualified. He replied that he was. In fact, he was not. And he then uh, uh, proceeded to try to fly an approach to this thing. We know from our data exactly when he switched over to uh, the ILS frequency. You can see this. Now, this may be a little hard to see also, but we were also able to track his entire path from this. And furthermore, the NTSB was able to work with this, and I'm going to enlarge this a little bit for you. You can see the actual attitudes of the aircraft during this period of time. Clearly, the pilot did lose control in IMC conditions, and uh, eventually uh, they pulled the, the uh, caps again, and the two occupants, although were injured, uh, they did survive. The problem is that uh, as they came down the parachute canopy hit a uh, guy wire for, for a radio tower and it, it kind of came out down a little differently than we would have liked. But basically they walked away from the accident even though they were injured. So we can get this kind of clarity and this kind of data but we have to work at it. It's, it's tough. Uh, one last one I'll talk about is uh, uh, a situation down in Luna, New Mexico we had back in April of last year. Again, this is what the data looks like, and there were pages and pages of it. It looked like a whole ream of paper with these printouts on it. So it's very time consuming, as you can imagine, to go through this and find the right stuff. We hope to improve on this with the data loggers. Um, but basically, this gentleman uh, had a flight that was going, uh, let's see if I can figure it out here. He was uh, uh, going from Tucson to Denver. He had an IFR flight plan. He was a low time instrument pilot. Late afternoon departure, took off, and uh, uh, filed an IFR, IFR flight plan, in fact, did take off IFR and was climbing up into the clouds when the aircraft started accumulating ice. He uh, asked for a higher altitude, which he received, and started climbing a little higher, was not able to get up to 17,000 where he had been cleared, and um, realized that uh, he had to come down. He asked for lower. He got that from ATC, and then he said, I'm descending right now, because he realized that he was uh, losing control. About that time, we were able to detect that the static port had iced over, and in fact, the stall warning went off in the airplane. Now, he was in the clouds, and so 
he assumed immediately that he had stalled the aircraft. Okay, and, and uh, so during that time, the airspeed indication went to zero. Altitude went kind of goofy, as he said. All the numbers on the PFD were in red, which would be a bad sign. And uh, so he, he uh, kind of forgot that he'd been on autopilot this time and just sort of stuffed the nose down to get it down. And um, he was um, doing okay. He may have actually had time to, to sort of recover the aircraft. But uh, just below 8,000 feet, the TAWS warning went off. This would be the terrain warning, which is also part of you know, the TAA. It saved a lot of folks, by the way. So the TA goes off, and he says, you know, that's it. I'm out of here. He pulled the handle on the CAP system, and it takes a few seconds for this thing to deploy. And the accident site was, in fact, at 8,000 feet. And uh, we figured that he had something like a half a second between the time the chute fully deployed and the time he impacted the ground. So there you go. Um, probably not mining manners here, but we have a little depiction not only where he was, but also what altitudes he was at during that period of time. So we can overlay this data. We can get a pretty good idea now of what's going on. It's a lot easier for us to, to do these, uh, these kinds of things. Now, I go out and talk a lot of places around the country and to a lot of uh, investigation outfits, the NTSB, FAA, and also some first responders, such as the Civil Air Patrol and a lot of fire uh, companies around the country, because a lot of these folks don't really understand that in some of these new airplanes, not just limited to TAA, we have uh, new recovery systems. I've mentioned the CAPS for the Cirrus, the Cirrus airframe parachute system. It's uh, a ballistic parachute system, which can be deployed. There's something like 26,000 of these installed in various aircraft around the country. And to give you some perspective of how many that is, we only have about 23,000 privately registered um, business jets, if you will. So there's more parachutes flying around than we have business jets right now. And we expect that number to double within the next two years. We also have airbags on board these aircraft, and the problem is that if the pilot doesn't use some of these systems, especially the BRS, uh, in, in the course of the accident, now we have a, a live rocket charge at the accident site. And so a lot of people don't realize that there's some hazards involved, and I'd like to kind of address those really quickly if we can go through this. By the way, the fellow going uh, from, uh, to Denver, uh, we noticed that the PDOT heat was never turned on, which is why he lost all his numbers. Uh, he did figure that out, and when he did turn on the PDOT heat, he immediately got some airspeed uh, indication of 159 knots and, and so forth, but uh, it was too late. And when he got the TAWS warning, that's when he punched out. So uh, we, this is very clear what happened on this one. So the new technology does present uh, some challenges uh, to read and analyze, and uh, there are some rewards in that we can get good, meaningful data. And then we're going to talk about some hazards with these new safety pieces, which means that we have to think differently when we go out and, and, uh, to an accident site for investigation purposes, rescue purposes, what have you, and uh, realize that these things can be on board. And it's not necessarily very easy to tell that they are on board because there are no external signs on them. Uh, particularly, we have a little small one on the Cirrus, but, but uh, you know, by the time you get on top of it and can actually read the sign, you're probably too close. Uh, by the same token, on cars today, we don't have external warnings about airbags inside of cars. That's on the visor, as you know. And so I think that um, you know, we may not ever be able to get legislated big signs on the airplane, and maybe that's not necessary. So I'm telling you that some of these devices can be in airplanes, and if you go out to a GA accident, certainly a single engine accident, your chances are better than 50% that we're going to have either airbags or a ballistic parachute system on board that aircraft. And uh, you need to just be aware that it's there. It's better to uh, know that it's there and find it than to be surprised <laughs> by, by your discovery. That can be hazardous. So uh, we're going to say that you just have to change how you think. Just assume it's like a loaded gun, always loaded, and uh, just beware. So that's the ballistic parachute system. We have the AAIR, which is the airbag system made by AMSAFE, AMSAFE Aircraft Inflatable Restraints. They're doing a great job. NTSB is doing a study on those now today. Uh, they're finding that these devices work really well as long as you plug them back in after you've taken the seat out. Uh, that's the only failure we've had, by the way. Composites, a lot of these new aircraft are, have a lot of composites in them. The Cirrus certainly is uh, an all-composite airplane. We're not alone in that respect, and there's some hazards you have to uh, recognize and respect at the accident site. And a little thing that I learned uh, a couple months ago when I was up in Seattle, this is maybe a little hard to see, but in the, uh, on the Cirrus doors and, and many other aircraft out there, we have these pneumatic and or uh, you know, gas struts that will actually hold a door open or assist you to open a lid. You probably have some on your car on the trunk lid or something. Um, I was talking to a fireman who said that his people were uh, working a truck fire one day 
They had an engine on fire and of course the hood was open. And eventually the fire was able to melt the ends that retained this particular device. And the device, because it was pressurized, shot across the accident site about 30 feet into one of his men's leg. Now, if, had he struck a vital area on this, on this fellow, he probably wouldn't have made it, but as it turns out, it kind of passed right through. So it's these little things that you don't think about, really, when you're on an accident site that can get you. It's uh, just something I talk about all the time, because I didn't know about it. I'm thinking, gee, we've got 3,700 airplanes out there. And they've all got two of these struts. Composites are a wonderful thing, and as you can see from this picture, uh, they're very crash-worthy. Okay, this is a deer hit on a SR-22, and we've actually had one guy that hit five geese in flight with an SR-22 and managed to land safely, and the aircraft was repaired and, and returned to service. Um, fiberglass and composites, as we call it now today, uh, do, do change uh, the equation as far as safety is concerned. They, they fail differently, they fail incrementally, they absorb energy very well, and accidents that uh, happen out in the field with composite airplanes typically have people walking away from them, in which would have been fatal otherwise. And that's why I'm saying, although TAA hasn't maybe yet changed the equation uh, exactly, we're finding that people are walking away from accidents. Still having accidents, but they're not fatal. Uh, that's, that's really a good thing. So this is very crash-worthy stuff. Now when you go out to the site, this will break up and be in pieces, and like anything else out there, you know, we can have fires and we can have smoke and, and so forth. This is um, uh, a typical site, as you can see, the aircraft's off to the left there, but the smoke right in front of you is from the forest fire, and this stuff is no good for you either. It's got carcinogens in it. Uh, some of the airplanes today, even uh, the experimentals out here, my Long Easy, for example, had uh, had urethane foam in the nose, and when urethane foam burns, it certainly gives off toxical, toxic chemicals. So that's something you have to be aware of when you're out on these sites, not just with composite airplanes, but we certainly bring it up when we're talking about composites. So we uh, encourage people to approach the site from upwind. Uh, a lot of splinters can uh, occur if the, if the for example, uh, unidirectional glass, carbon uh, pieces still have some resin around them. They can be almost like knitting needles that are very sharp and you can be severely injured if you happen to step on one. Now, when you're out on the site, you know, you're being aware all the time. Your head's on a swivel, as they say. You're looking everywhere. It's rare that you're actually looking at your feet and looking at what you're walking on. And that's where you're going to get hurt with these things. And it's, uh, it can be a very painful thing. And, of course, you can get uh, pretty injured. And a lot of these sites are in the middle of nowhere. And so if you're injured on a site, it, it can be a, a more serious situation than if you're in town, for example. So these are some things that we uh, caution people about out on site. These are pictures of some of these shards, some of these pieces that you might step on. I know it's kind of hard to discern exactly what they are, but uh, they, they can be everywhere and anywhere on a site, and so you just have to be aware of what's going on. Now the uh, airbags uh, are automatically deployed, unlike the CAP system, which the pilot has to activate. Uh, these are working very well, as I said. They're protecting the occupants from head and upper body injuries, and, and they, they are available in a whole spectrum of, of aircraft. In fact, when I first started talking about them, I had a little list of who had them and who didn't, and that list is so long, and, and, and we're getting approvals every day for retrofits on these, to the point where I don't even have an idea uh, who has them. Uh, it's being very popularly uh, approved, and uh, they're going in a lot of airplanes, uh, standard equipment, and you can retrofit them to just about anything out there now. And uh, I think it's going to be just like the cars. At some point, you're going to find airplanes that have, um, uh, you know, airbags on board as standard equipment right across the board. Here's, a, here's a, what a Cessna three-point harness looks like. And, of course, the airbag's in the lap belt portion of it. And on the Cirrus, we have uh, double shoulder harnesses, and the bag is actually in the outboard side. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you a movie of how these things deploy. It's just a, a short shot here. And um, you'll see that the bag actually deploys initially away from the occupant if the movie will run. Some days it does, and some days it doesn't. Uh, what this movie would show you when it gets caught up is that it will deploy initially away from the occupant and then actually vent at the same time. And that's to allow the occupant to get out of the cockpit uh, 10 minutes after deployment. I'm sorry the movie isn't working. Well, here it goes. Okay, well, we'll just kind of watch it in steps here. Notice that there's uh, kind of a white uh, powder coming out of it that's actually helium. And um, uh, we want that bag to deflate within 10 seconds of deployment so it's easier to get, make your way out of the cockpit. Well, it's not going to cooperate, so we'll just keep going here. These are what the components look like. We have a, a helium uh, bottle and also the brains for this thing. 
And they're better than a car system. They have a much better trigger on them. They're safer for the EMTs to work with. And, um, you know, the car system was, was not very well touted by the automotive industry, and a lot of first responders actually got hurt because they didn't know they were there. And that's something we want to avoid. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of zoom through this rather quickly. Um, these, these things are powered independently. We can actually put them on the floor right here and make them work. You don't shut them off by taking the battery out of the aircraft or cutting the cables. They're absolutely independently powered so that they work all the time. To disarm them on a Cessna, for example, um, it's got a little magnetic switch in the three-point harness and you just simply unbuckle there uh, and it will disarm the system. Uh, the Cirrus, uh, uh, well, before I go to the Cirrus, we'll just say on these uh, Cessna and Mooney three-pointers and so forth, you, you want to not connect these when the airplane's not being used because that does arm the system. In the old days, we, you know, clean up the airplane, hook all the harnesses up, and then we'd say, well, okay, looks nice for the customer. We don't want to do that anymore because it does arm the system. On the Cirrus, it's a little different. We have these uh, uh, little four-point uh, cannon plugs that we have to disconnect to disarm them each at each seat. You have to pull them apart. And uh, they can, uh, well, they're designed to stay together, and so it's kind of hard to get them apart, but you do have to do that to disarm them. And uh, you can also, if you're an investigator, you can cut the cable right here if you're in a hurry. Uh, we've also learned that if you take the seat out in a hurry, that it'll break right there also. And uh, let's go very quickly to the parachute systems. Uh, basically, these are very safe and reliable systems. We've saved over 208 lives with them worldwide. And uh, our job here is to try to tell you that they're in there and just to be uh, cautious with them, working around them. Uh, you can find them in a lot of different airplanes. As I said, there's 26,000 of these things out there, only 3,700 Cirruses. And so we're less than 10% of the total. Here you see a Cessna, a standard looking Cessna. This one is equipped with a system. You can't tell by looking at it. So that's why I said earlier, you have to assume that these things are in there and uh, be safe and uh, be disappointed if you don't find one. And I'm going to sh say that these are, are approved, of course, for the Cessna 150s, 152s, 172s, 182s. I'm going to show you right now a test on one of these systems, uh, if, if, if we can get the movie to run. And right now it doesn't seem to want to do that. Oop, here we go. Um, this is a test we did for certification on a 182, and um, it's just not coming up. I'm sorry. Well, what it shows is the, the actual rocket pulling the parachute out of the back end of the airplane through the rear window. That's a place that a lot of people don't expect the parachute to come out. Um, so if you're on an accident site and uh, trying to figure out if there's a parachute in there or not, look around. You'll see a red T-handle such as this one. This is on a uh, Flight Designs aircraft, CT. Uh, you'll find these handles all over the place. You'll find them on the floor in the, in the Cessnas. You'll find them in the ceiling on the, one, on the uh, 150s. Uh, you'll find them uh, overhead on the Cirruses. Sometimes the whole thing is exposed to the outside. Here you see a canister that com contains the parachute, and also right next to it is a, the actual rocket. This rocket uh, simply pulls the parachute out of the uh, canister in this case, gets it away from the airplane so it can open automatically. And the, the key is that all these are connected with a cable. This is not an electrical cable. This is a housed cable like you might have on your bicycle for uh, handbrakes or clutch on a motorcycle, perhaps. And um, there's lots and lots of little airplanes that have these things. You'll probably find a lot of them right out here at Sun and Fun. So uh, what's a rocket look like? Well, typically they're cylindrical. They'll have a cable uh, attached to them, something like that. If you see that thing, you need to call somebody. Um, they come all sizes, but typically they're cylinders. And you ne wouldn't necessarily identify them as a rocket by looking at them. Um, these are some of the components that we look for at the accident sites. If you see these things, then you need to call somebody, and that somebody would be Cirrus. We have an 800 number, which I'll show you in a second. These are the cables that, that activate these things. And the pilot has to work these things. We, we do not have automated parachutes, and uh, we want to give the uh, pilot some latitude on what to do. He may simply have lost an engine, may simply be able to make an emergency landing, which, of course, all pilots are trained to do. Um, and he may want to do that instead of pulling the parachute. So we can't shut these things off. They're always on. In the Cirrus, we pull a handle like this, and I'll go through this cartoon relatively quickly because it shows a cross-section of the rocket and the igniter and how this works. We'll pull the handle. The cable will pull on this igniter at the bottom of it. And if you look at the uh, bottom of the picture here, you'll see this spring collapsing, which is part of the igniter. Coxon fires all at the same time. It's almost instantaneous, and uh, that's how we get the rocket to go. It, uh, Again, just pulls the package out of the airplane, and it's, it's very successful. It works fine. And my slides won't go forward now. Okay. <laughs> so we can do it manually. Here we go. 
Oh dear. Okay. This uh, other hazard that we're concerned with is the parachute can't be detached from the aircraft. And in this particular case, we had a, a gentleman lose control of the airplane and he decided to pull the handle and three people landed safely and they walked away from the airplane. Well, it was in a part of the country where it's very flat and very windy. And uh, the parachute, which is huge, got inflated and pulled the airplane over backwards and actually dragged it several hundred feet. Um, and so, uh, thanks to the FAA, they were able to clip the cables on this thing before it got to Texas. And uh, we were very happy about that. But it is a hazard you have to be aware of if you're out there working on the site, that these things can, can drag the airplane some distance. Uh, so, we w again, we want you to work from the upwind side. And, and if you have a fireman handy and they have a hose and truck available, wet the parachute down so that it'll collapse. It's the best way to do it. And then once you've got it collapsed, you can park your G car or some other vehicle on it so it won't inflate on you again. Uh, we also recommend that people approach the aircraft from the front or the sides, as you can see here. Try to stay away from the back. That would be the barrel of this thing, if it, as it were. So you want to stay away from the back in case it might uh, deploy. And uh, we also want you not to cut into the top of the airplane because that's where the deployment cable is located. So if you were to, for example, snag that, it might uh, actually deploy the rocket if it was still in the airplane. When you go to one of these things, please never pull the handle to try to disactivate or deactivate it. Say, so, well, if I pull the handle, you know, on my terms, we know that uh, it went. Don't do that because if during the uh, course of the accident, the propellant got mangled or, or broken up inside there, it will burn at a different rate than was designed. And the nozzle is only designed to take so much thrust. So you could have yourself a, well, uh, you know, a really big road flare on your hands uh, or worse. So we don't want that. The FAA, in fact, said, look, we don't want our people to be bomb disposal experts. So if you see these things, identify that you have them, notify somebody, and that's somebody to notify a Cirrus. And in fact, I get calls from people who aren't even involved with Cirruses. The FAA's called me on five occasions, uh, as er, late as last year, on aircraft that weren't ours. They say, hey, you're the rocket man. Uh, I heard you talk down in uh, Oklahoma City. Tell us what to do. So we'd walk them through it. Here's the number. Uh, it's an 800 number, you're going to be met by a live person, not a robot. So when you call 800-279-4322, you're going to be able to say, look, I want to report an accident, and we need to talk to somebody in air safety. And that's the number you're going to get. And that's the person you're going to get, one of our people. Please do not call the bomb, bomb disposal, disposal squad. Excuse me. Um, bomb disposal squads only have one mission in life, and that's to blow stuff up. We have to remember this is federal evidence. And we want to look at this piece of the aircraft along with everything else that we do to see if it worked, how it worked, how well it worked. This is evidence, and it's all part of the investigation. So we don't want them removing things, first of all, and then destroying stuff, which is what they do. Uh, I've been out many times to disarm these things, and uh, this is an old slide, but uh, it seems to work pretty well. And our guys are very serious about this. I mean, they're very good at, at doing this. We've got the right tools and the right training. And so when they're doing their job out there, we'd recommend that you kind of treat the situation seriously and, and not uh, do any pranks. You know, the firemen love to pull pranks on each other, so I, I put this picture in for them. Uh, they usually like that. Uh, how's the best way to get the word out to people? We, Cirrus has actually got a DVD that we offer. It's free. looks like this. Uh, inside, it's got a, uh, a shirt, shirt pocket guide uh, in the pocket as well as a DVD and my card and the 800 number I talked about. The uh, guide talks about what to do if you encounter a rocket or a ballistic Repair, uh, you know, parachute system and or the airbag system. What to do, who to call. It's all right there. And it's only about 15 minutes long. It's great initial training, and it's really good for recurrent training, too. Uh, we've shipped out thousands of these things, thousands of these things worldwide to fire departments everywhere, and uh, a lot to the FAA. So if we have a few minutes, uh, we, we would uh, open a thing for questions, if you have them, if we have time. and one comment. Sure. Uh, one, I used to fly the ATR for American Eagle, and okay. uh, we weren't allowed by our ops, either by our procedures or ops spec, to use the vertical speed mode. We could only use indicated airspeed mode specifically for the instance you were talking about. Yep. I don't know if that's uh, if that's being considered in the, in the training. Um, so. We, I can't I can't answer your question directly. We're we're getting better at training people to deal with uh, these new airplanes, the new knobology, if you will, and uh, a lot of uh, flight schools have actually bought services so that their people can train on our aircraft so they can get into commuters at some point uh, that are pretty well equipped today. Um, we also are doing scenario-based training because we have a sim, and we actually put them into situations where we make them reach for the 
make them reach for the handle. And uh, that's turning out to be a very, very valuable tool for us. We can also use the SIM when we take this data out of the airplane, if we, we can reconstruct uh, a lot of the path, as I said, the speeds and so forth, we can actually plug that whole scenario into our, our flight simulator and fly it again and see maybe what the pilot was seeing. So that helps. I can't answer your question directly about the airspeed zone. I'm sorry. That, that was, we found that also it avoided the vertical speed scenario where it didn't do, the airplane wouldn't perform. The indicated airspeed mode was a real, real lifesaver for distractions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding the accident which they went for photo. Uh, the, my understanding uh, from your narration is that they went up to 4,000 feet and then they start either f stall or spend whatever they have. Did the, when you were talking or investigating with the pilot, did he realize that he was installed and did he know how to recover or just lift it? Well, sometimes um, it's difficult to, to understand um, the pilot because they, uh, you know, they've just survived a, a life-threatening event and sometimes they're, they're very clear on what was happening and they, they know exactly to the second what it was. They can talk to you as if it was a slow motion movie and others can't tell you their name at that point. And so, so we get all kinds of, uh, you know, replies back to our questions. In this particular case, the uh, gentleman was pretty disoriented and, um, didn't really understand uh, much and we weren't able to get a lot from this particular pilot but it's very clear that they were more focused on shooting pictures than they were on flying the aircraft and although the settings on the autopilot initially were okay uh, they weren't managed very well because you reach a point uh, on the settings that he had that the airplane is not going to be able to fly and the autopilot was doing what it was told to do it's just it was a heavy hot day and uh, you know, the airplane just couldn't perform, so it eventually just pitched down. Um, I think it's fair to say that the pilot and the occupants were distracted, um, and uh, I don't think there's any argument about that. And, uh, you know, it's always sorry that these things happen, but we're very grateful that they were able to survive thanks to the, thanks to the parachute. And the data showed us what was going on. We did see the airspeed decreasing to a point where, where he should have picked that up and, and readjusted the autopilot or started flying manually. Uh, he had those options, didn't see it happening, and all of a sudden it just pitched down. That's when he first became aware of it. Yes. We have a lady over here, yes. M Mike, I'd like to know how you have um, developed your training to include management of the autopilot. It seems as though autopilots are very important in a, in a TAA aircraft. Autopilots are indeed very important. Uh, they're a critical piece to the puzzle uh, because these airplanes, first of all, can, are very capable. They can go long distances and um, it's kind of tiring to hand fly the whole time and so people tend to use the autopilot a lot. The autopilots today right across the board are very, very reliable. They're great pieces of equipment and they have a lot of capacity. Um, we've learned now that when we do um, a delivery to one of our customers, we have a transit, what we call a transition training course at the, uh, at the, at the factory where the pilot comes to pick up his airplane, we actually put him in his airplane, and after he has accepted it, then we'll go out and train him for up to three to four to five days to make sure he understands, as we say, all the knobology, where everything is located, and more important, how to use it. And uh, we teach them the autopilot very, very carefully because we know they're going to use it a lot. Um, again, we do a lot of scenario-based training in the sim as well. And uh, we want to make sure they understand how to disconnect it, how to manage it, what the capabilities of it are, what the capabilities and limitations of the airplane are. And we try to marry all that together in the three to five days. And I think we've been very successful with that to the point where, as I say, these TAA airplanes are showing that relatively inexperienced pilots with the automation, uh, help of automation, can really uh, become quite uh, productive. The one thing that we caution people about, though, is to not fly on automation into some place where you don't want to be if automation should go away on you <laughs> for some reason. So that's the thing we stress there. Yes, hi. Um, I, I understand that this is about you know the NTSB showing up for accident investigations. And I have a situation where last November I had a catastrophic engine failure. Those are the FAA's words. 
over uh, the mountains of North Carolina. But I was managed to get an airport under me and a runway in front of me, and I landed safely. Yeah. And it was just completely quiet. There was no personal injury. There was no property damage except for the engine itself and, and a few dents in the cowling from parts flying around under there. And uh, I, I left the scene, and the people that were there, the managed people that were managing the FBO, called the FAA in, and they came in and took pictures and left. They've never contacted me. I've never spoken with them. Mm. I've called the NTSB, and they're taking kind of a passive interest in this because it's so low profile. And I was told that this engine will eventually be shipped back to Teledyne Continental, and it'll be swept under the carpet. They're supposed to do an analytical, which means an, an analysis of what happened. And there's a number of people out there that have this kind of engine that want to know just what happened. And I've been told that, well, it wasn't my fault, and we don't know yet whether it was a maintenance issue, whether it was a factory issue, or what was going on with that engine. But there's a number of people that want to know. But since it's so low profile, it gives Continental the opportunity to just say, well, it's on the shelf over here, and it'll be forgotten about. And because it's a not NTSB driven, this is what I'm told, the analytical is not NTSB driven, that it's going to take its time. It could take six months to a year before they get around to it, if they even decide to do that. And so what can we do to try and move that process along, even though it's very um, you know, under the table, it's very low profile compared to some of the accidents that happen out there? Well, there's a number of things we can do. First of all, uh, I can assure you uh, from having been on numerous accidents over the last nine years that when we form an investigation party, you'll have an NTSB person, an FAA representative, and an engine rep, and an airframe rep at the site. So there's typically at least four of us there. We form the team, and um, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a lightweight team, but we, we actually are, are very good at putting these teams together and working very well on it. Um, Regardless of whether it was an investigation or not on it, which probably is not required, um, TCM, I can assure you, will tear that engine down. They do want to find out what happened. And so my recommendation today to, uh, to kind of accelerate matters is that you go over to the Continental Tent today and ask for Kirk Nelson. He's there. He's, uh, he's a rep. He understands this very well. Um, I don't think the guy that runs analytical is here today. I didn't see him yesterday, but he could be here. And... Uh, his name is uh, Terry Horton. And if Terry's here, uh, he's the one that would schedule that. Uh, mind you, anytime they get a fatal accident or uh, an NTSB coded accident, yes, they will put a priority on that simply because that's you know, really important too. Um, but they'll shoehorn you in, and I, I assure you, they will go through that engine. And when they do it, it happens fairly quickly. Uh, we can typically go through an engine in about a day or less, depending on what the issue is. I think the longest one I've ever been on was about two days. Uh, typically, the shortest one's about three hours. So somewhere between uh, three hours and two days, you can have a, a written report saying what actually happened. Uh, Terry Horton is the manager of that particular area. Uh, Kirk Nelson is the contact here at Sun and Fun. He is here. He will be here all week. And they're at the Continental Tent. That's the best I can do for you today. And Yes, sir, that will work. They're very good at this, by the way, and they're, they're very diligent on doing this. I've been through a number of teardowns. Yes. Okay, anybody else? Yes. We appreciate your questions. Go ahead. Do you know, uh, and this is outside the accident realm, uh, do insurance companies, when people pull a parachute in a $300,000 airplane, do they look at that? Do you know if they cover it or they say, sorry, that wasn't an accident? I'm glad you brought that up. It's a good, it's a good point. I think there were some wives' tales out there in the early days that, gee, if you pull the handle, you destroy the airplane, you know, <laughs> automatically. And um, it, took, it took a while for people to understand that, you know, fiberglass and composites uh, are very repairable. And of the, of the 12 deployments that we've had, 10 of those have been not only repaired, but returned to service. Uh, the other two uh, weren't even recoverable. One of them was at the bottom of the ocean, and uh, another one was really broken up uh, when it hit uh, the Hudson River. So. Um, I can tell you that uh, they are very repairable, and for that reason, it's a fairly expensive airplane. Uh, we can actually do repairs on it, which in the insurance parlance is economically feasible. They, let's say you have a $400,000, $500,000 airplane, you can sometimes fix it for $125,000. Uh, that looks to an insurance company like a really good deal. And I also might point out that when they come down under caps, they don't have to pay a death, panel, uh, a death benefit which, gosh, that should be in their accounting somewhere. So uh, we think that it's a really good deal, and, and they do uh, have the ability to fix these things. We, we do have composite classes that we teach at, at, 
at Cirrus at the factory. We also have 160 some odd service centers out there that are capable of fixing these things, as well as a number of independent people that can fix them. So composites are uh, truly a boon to the uh, industry, and they're, they're very crashworthy, and they are very repairable. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, well, I thank you for your time and your patience this morning, and welcome to Sun and Fun, and go out and have fun. Thank you very much for your time. Okay.